Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Hotline League. Travis Gafford is on the road edition because I'm on the road and I'm in Salt Lake City in a hotel room producing the show. And uh, I'm going to get tired of holding this microphone because it's kind of heavy and I don't have a stand because those are, don't travel well. Anyway, I'm joined right now by my constant co-host, Mark Zimmerman. How's it going, Mark? Uh, going good. Um, this week is a really fun week. It's when the off-season rumors have mostly slowed down. Worlds has slowed down. And uh, so we have to crucify North American pros. And that's going swimmingly. Vulcan did everyone a solid by kind of going out and offering himself up as the sacrificial lamb by tweeting, admittedly, some dumb shit. Um, and here we are. Yeah. No, yeah. I, uh, I'm i happy that he gave us a lot of content to be making for the show tonight. And if anybody is watching the video and you're wondering why Mark's stuff is delayed, we don't know. It's probably hotel Wi-Fi, but it's not just on stream. It's all the way into me. So there's nothing I can do about it. So this is the show you get, and it's free. All right. Uh, Peter Dunn is here. Peter Dunn, welcome to the show. We're, we're finalizing your worldwide sh tour actually no that i hear you're going on the name and podcast this week am i okay then great <laughs> wait you're not <laughs> who's booking your shows i might i might, I might be uh... okay i yeah somebody told me that you were coming on so the fact that you uh don't know is uh well it's concerning I mean, all, all i could say is that there's a very short period of time when i'm no, not attached to a team so i can say whatever i want without being disciplined so that's that you know that's really, not really how nice. it works like you can't say whatever you want because the new team will also be like if you said something that's going to piss off the new team it'll be a thing right true if there is a new team yeah that's yeah um, i mean yeah i mean again looking forward to having a fun day today as you said there's been lots of content uh, I saw you at the at the Magic the Gathering Magic Fest this this weekend. Yes. Oh, so here's here's oh. where I've here's here's where things have been for me. So I came out originally to well I booked originally for Salt Lake City because I was going to go to uh, Dragon Steel Con, which is Brandon Sanderson's convention. It's happening. Uh, it's been happening the last two days, and this is my dedication to all of you. I right now across the street directly from the hotel that I'm at, not to dox myself, is uh, the convention center where Brandon Sanderson is giving his like closing ceremony speech celebration party for the, the Lost Metal releasing, which is right here as I pull it up. And I am doing Hotline League anyway with all of you because I don't take entire weeks off. Uh, it's impossible. So we're doing and this. But... Oh, go ahead, Mark. I, I was going to say, and I haven't read uh, Wax and Wayne series, so, you know. Yeah. I'm not, like, waiting to read it either currently. Yes. Well, it's again, it's not about the waiting to read. It's about the fact that I could be listening to Brandon Sanderson speak. Uh, but then I found out that there was a Magic the Gathering thing happened in the same convention that Brandon Sanderson was part of. He was also part of the Magic Gathering thing. I mean... And they hooked me up, the MTG Summit, they hooked me up with a free like creator badge or whatever. So I did that, which was very fun. And I met a bunch of cool people, uh, a bunch of awesome creators, uh, Dana and Matt from EDH Rec, and uh, the professor who does a YouTube channel called Tolerian Community College. He was very nice. Uh, he followed me on Twitter, which I thought was very cool. So I followed him back. Uh, you know, it's been a good, it's been a good week. So... And tomorrow I may or may not be creating content with somebody who I really like, um, but I'm not holding my breath because this person's a busy man and I don't know if it's going to happen. But uh, it's been it's been a really good couple of days. Thank you for asking, Peter, because Mark never asks. You're muted, I think. Uh, you're maybe you've now you're now using push talk and you have your your sensitivity pushed up. So I don't know how it is that I'm on the road and my stuff is so much more understandable than you you're at like a family member's house yep <laughs> okay anyway <laughs> shout out <laughs> to <laughs> shout out to alienware and grubhub uh for sponsoring the show we're going to talk more about them in a little bit but mark how you been what's been going on with you how you been taking your your time off uh pretty good i 
have basically been doing Blame Game, Hotline League. I did one other thing yesterday, or I mean uh, last week, which hasn't come out yet. I mentioned it before, though, the Ultimate List thing. And then uh, this week, I have Jury Duty. Um, oh, yeah. How's that been going? So I, I didn't know this is how they do it in L.A. I did Jury Duty once before in Massachusetts. And over there, what they do is they just tell you to show up on the day, and then you, you show up for a little bit. Yeah, you get to check. Or not. Yeah, in L.A., at least, maybe it's all California, but like you have to every night basically check to see if you're going to get called the next day. Uh, so I haven't checked tonight yet. I technically can. Maybe at some point during the break, we'll do a live um, jury duty update and see if I'm called in for tomorrow. I've dodged it on Monday, Tuesday so far, hoping to dodge on Wednesday. Um, other than that, I'm working on my side projects. Those are those are going well. I'm having fun with that. What um, are those side projects? And I can't tell you. Otherwise, there'd be pressure to actually finish them as opposed to just dick around on them. Uh also, pro players might not have souls. Um, for North Americans, we need to figure that out. Uh, yes, you keep. Yes, we. You made this joke already at the start of the show about Vulcan. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so uh, I think that's all we're going to talk about today. Yeah. No, show. we'll talk about other stuff. So I did an interview with John Needham. That there was like a ton of big stuff that came out of that. Um, well, nothing. Nothing too big. I shouldn't say. It's not like they announced like the next four years of Worlds or whatever. But I think there is some interesting stuff. So, and we didn't talk about that on the last week's episode because it was not out yet. So if there was anything in the John Needham here, we're giving, this is the part where we give you guys all pro tips on how to get onto the show. Obviously pro player, lazy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we can talk about that. I know, I think Delphi had a really good version of that, that she wants to talk about on the show as a caller. I don't know. We'll see. And then also, uh, the, anything that you thought was interesting from the John Needham interview, I mean, it was 50 minutes long. We talked about a lot of different things. I hope that some of you found it interesting. Uh, and I think there was some, I mean, there's the roster rumors to, oh, you know what? The last time we did the episode, we could not talk about, or not, it's not that we couldn't talk about, but we, we couldn't talk about it because it was not something I put out there yet. The whole double if Bjergsen reuniting at hundred T thingy, uh, potentially. So that's, there's a go, there's a video on my channel. You can go watch that. I'm not sh as sure about speak of being part of that anymore. It might be closer. I don't know. I haven't heard which way or the other yet, but, uh, so that's another thing we can um, talk about. Here, any, any of the other roster we, stuff. We should do know. a community poll of which jungler you want with them. Spica, closer. And who was the third option? Santorin? I mean, San I never said Santorin was one of them, but yeah, he's obviously one of the people that's like moving around. What, what was the third? It was Spica, closer. I saw a third one. Uh, I, I didn't, know, maybe, maybe, I didn't say anything. I've never heard this. Never so heard this. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm mistaken. Roxas, Vince Kevin. No, I have not. I haven't heard this stuff, so I don't know what Mark's talking about. But I'm I'm probably just on drugs. Yeah. Um. So anyway, there's that. There's some other roster rumors. I'll be honest. Like I, I think we'll have an interesting show, especially because we have Peter on. And Peter, you always say some interesting, thoughtful things. But I've been kind of enjoying being on the road and getting to avoid all this. The majority of the players are lazy thing. Like it's just. Such an annoying conversation, and I hate that we oh. have to have it tonight, but it is what it is. I, I have another angle that we can also go, and it's um, sort of different. Because right before the NA Pros or Lazy thing took over, there was the um, Rigby, Lyra, and Cloud Templar thing. I mean, that's what started uh, the Pros are Lazy thing. Yeah, but like it, it was like the, pro, the Pros are Lazy thing was like a small portion in, a, in like a larger thing, you know? Um, and then obviously because Vulcan responded, that's kind of like what, what blew up. But I was actually going to talk about coaching in the East versus coaching in the West, and I thought that was going to be a really interesting really? game this week um, because I have some hot takes about it a little bit. Uh, and then, the, obviously, the, the pro player being lazy thing took on more of a name, and because I'm trying to stretch blame games for the rest of the season, I'll do the, the pro player being lazy one this week and the coaching one next week maybe. But uh, maybe since Peter's on, we can talk a little bit about that too. Yeah, East versus West is really fun. If you want to do East versus West, I've got a lot to say about that. Well, so East versus West is I, every time you say East versus West, everyone wrings their hands about it. I know there's differences. Like coaching the LCK is not the same as coaching the LPL, and like coaching in Europe is not the same as coaching in NA. Um, just saying, like broadly speaking, um, yeah. some I differences. Mean, coaching top esports is not the same as coaching Edward Gaming. You know, it's yeah, very, very it changes from team to team as well. <laughs> Yeah, I well, I mean, we'll be able to talk about that. I think it'd be nice if we could because then Mark can just steal that content for the blame game. Um, 
And like, here's a clip of Peter Dunn saying something. We we're very efficient with our content creation here, especially during the final six weeks of the year or seven weeks of the year where we are. Uh, yeah, I, guys, we talked about the audio sync stuff. Please stop talking about it. And if not, you should just put a, a text thing over my head saying Mark is desynced. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, it's it'll save your sanity in the long run. You should do it. Yeah, I don't know. It drives me crazy when people show up like after the show started and start being bringing up stuff that would be obviously the case since the beginning. Papa Smithy. Um, okay, so let's let's start. I don't know. We guess we can talk about what we're doing. Actually, Peter, let's talk a little bit about you. Uh, yeah, what is up, your dude? what? What's your next job? Um, I'm enjoying off season. Um, podcast guest. I've, uh, that's what that's what I'm going to be doing for the next. Do few you months. make much money doing that? <laughs> Not as much as one would hope. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe yeah, you, you can't afford a microphone because he doesn't make any money in his current job. Oh, that's true. Exactly. If anyone would pay him, he would buy a microphone, but everyone just uses him and complains about his microphone, but doesn't give him any money for appearing. Yeah. Exactly, you know. Yeah. No, uh it's okay, so you you can't say what your next job is, even though I think it's already been reported. Well, I mean I'm not on the G C D, that's all I'll say. Okay, yeah, that's fair, that's fair, that's fair. Okay. Uh, so that means he's still up for grabs because he hasn't signed anything. Because once you sign something, then that's when you have to do it. So people can go beat his current offer. No uh, one verbally agrees to anything prior to signing. What yep, did you... Exactly. So so going broader on the, the Lyra Rigby stuff, what did you think of that, Peter, as, as a former colleague of Rigby? What specifically about it? Because All of it. Of All of it. Did, were you just like, uh, this man... Doesn't know what he's talking about. Were you like, oh God, he's saying what we've all been saying behind the scenes? Like, I don't know. But uh, what was your take? I mean, I know that Rigby and Lyra are very close friends, and it's good. It's good that they finally got to talk to each other again because you know, um, at Worlds he wanted to do the high Lyra thing in his notebook, and Kari kept giving it. Oh yeah, <laughs> the cups. <laughs> so I'm glad that they finally got to meet up. You know, it's pretty hard to meet up across oceans in this day and age. Yeah, yeah. Mark, people are confused about what you what you referenced. Oh, um, Rigby told a story. I don't remember where I saw it now about how um, he on the world stage had written something in his notebook about Lyra. I think it was just High Lyra or something. Yeah, um, it was High and he was going to show it to the camera um, when it was on him, but then cowrie for some reason like had a cup on his desk and just didn't want it there so he just like reached backwards without looking to try and hand it to someone and then like rigby just kind of like took it and then he didn't have time to show the high lira thing uh. yeah and he had, there was a second cup i think there were three cups right because it was cups within <laughs> cups so he kept being given cups on this thing <laughs> so yeah he never got to show it and that's why cowrie's supposedly going back to europe because uh he just he's disrupting the broadcast too much okay uh no okay but what what did you actually think uh peter like when you look at that stuff i i know i'm sure you don't want to like throw anybody in the bus if you disagree but i i don't know were you surprised by how candid he uh rigby was in particular uh i don't know what do you what do you think mm, it's hard to say right like i think a lot of stuff was lost in translation um positive and negative um definitely because you know i've spoken to rigby since um and it seems that there was some nuance that was there was a bit that was a bit missed um i mean i can imagine that because that shit happens all the time on reddit where people transcribe yeah. something or like whatever and there's just a lot that's missed yeah i mean like so much was said so i'm not deliberately trying to dodge the question it's just i don't want to talk for an hour whilst you've got callers on the on the waiting list but yeah, you know callers uh, there's there's a lot of people there's a lot of people who uh who are very interested in hearing what uh, a korean perspective on the western scene right so um you could tell that that he that i think it was a you know people are very interested and in, you know he he is more equipped than maybe any other korean coach except maybe reaper to have an opinion uh, and obviously reaper is going to be working esports next year i assume um whereas rigby has two years off right or one and a half years off because he has to go to the army so he was in a unique place, maybe, that 
um, to give his opinions without maybe fear of repercussion that others might face in a position such as his own. So it seemed very, very candid. Obviously, I don't agree with every single thing that he said, um, but uh, I see a lot of where he's coming from. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what he said, you know, like about uh, the environment. Uh, we're going to talk about LCS teams later. Uh, it's very interesting that everyone is dogpiling on Vulcan because one of the things that uh, he said specifically is that EG did work very hard. I mean, he's not saying that we worked the hardest you could possibly work, but EG, I, I think it was very clear who the three hardest working teams were in summer. Like if you asked anybody, um, people would have said TL, C, uh, CLG, EG, right? Uh, were clearly the three hardest working teams. And in spring, it was obviously EG, right? Like it was just clearly, clearly EG. So a lot of those things, which people are ascribing to NA pros as a whole, uh, and using Vulcan as a as a convenient uh, target dummy, you know, maybe they're targeting the wrong people. That's what I would say uh, for that. So. I mean, I think Vulcan did a, everybody else on the LCS. All the other players are solid and taught them never be honest because well, the community doesn't like that. Uh, so actually, right. when I saw the Vulcan tweet, uh, I actually thought he was taking a dig at Steve. From TL. I thought he was being for the TL uh, Steve at first too. Yeah, it's because you guys missed the original tweet, right? Um. Yeah. Well, I didn't see initially who he was responding to. I just saw like other people responding to his tweet at first. So then I had, to, you know, you do that thing where you see a bunch of replies about Steve, and you're like, wait, who's? Why are we flaming Steve? Yeah, and then you go yeah, to yeah. Balkans and you go in again, you know. Yeah, Steve. Steve caught strays, unfortunately, on Un very unintentional <laughs> yeah. strays. Everyone named Steve caught a stray. Yeah. Bogans had a had a nice uh, uh, victory over Reggie. You know, a, a fun a fun one at Jack, and you know now he's got one on Steve. So yeah, good on yeah. him. All right, so I think maybe we just hop into callers. Uh, I guess. You I guess, uh, so we should say as well that it'll be a little bit earlier of a night because Travis does want to party hardy with all the Mormons. Um, and so that means he has to get out of here slightly earlier than usual, right? Uh, yeah, I think instead of ending at, at 9 Pacific, we'll end at probably about 8.45 Pacific. It's not because I need to party. It's just because <laughs> I actually have to prepare for something tomorrow. Um, but yeah, you guys are gonna go out and slam some glasses of water. Yeah, that's uh, get some anyway. Milk, Mark, ask, let's hooligans. move on from less religiously affiliated topics and onto the calls. <laughs> All right, fine. Um, there's a lot of people in here, so I won't do the usual spiel. We got plenty of topics. Uh, it's a spicy night. It looks like people are looking forward to this a little bit. So I'm just gonna go out uh, right away. Let's do it. Awesome. Off Mark goes to grab somebody. Thank you to Numi for gifting a sub, Zypher. For the 10 months, Jordasaur, a little uh, Numi gifting a sub to Cambards, Mag Magi, Topple the Nun, Pacho McPach, a Wrath for gifting to Delfino, Invert, Miser, and it looks like Mark is back with our first guest of the night, which is Delfino. Delfino, where are you calling from? I am calling from Orlando. So, Delfino, I'm a little nervous because earlier you messaged, uh, or I saw in the chat, that you had like sort of your thoughts on this topic and you wrote like a giant Google page worth of stuff. Okay. So I'm hoping <laughs> hopefully that you've distilled it because I didn't have time today to talk to you about how to distill it. So what's your take? Okay. Well, my take is that for like a lot of the people calling for NA pros to specifically grind solo queue aren't really considering considering like critical information that's like honestly public. And I think that's why Vulcan kind of lashed out like that and why it's kind of like unfair to criticize the pros in that sense. Okay. And what is this public information? Um, the first, the solo queue quality is considerably worse. It's been confirmed by pros both in NA and internationally, right? Yeah, but and we like have champions that, queue. Oh, that's actually 0. 0.1.5. <laughs> um, uh, champions queue quality is better than solo queue um including korean solo queue in some people's opinions and but it's harder to play because you can't like com like you have to comms there's no flaming there's no pinging there's nothing like that you have to actually like focus up and play well and it's not in like an, an end all be all right because like obviously because it's smaller the queue times are going to be longer there's going to be longer queue times for certain positions and there's still problems with it but i do believe that pros should play champions queue a lot more Okay. 
And then what else you got on the list? Okay. Um, I want to shout out Hina for this one. She uh, kind of introduced the idea of the do and be barrel spectrum. Um, they're both world champions, successful players, but um, it's like 16 to 18 hours of solo queue a day versus like four to six, right? But they're both extremely successful. And I want to like, I have an analogy that kind of emphasizes how like people learn differently and people improve differently. Okay, go for it. Um, so like I, you guys, I, like nobody knows this about me because I don't really kind of share it on the internet, but Well, you've only was... called in once, so people don't really know you in general, but continue. <laughs> I mean, okay, well, I used to swim like on a really competitive level. I was going D1 and then I quit because I burned out really badly, right? Um, but like, it's kind of like an analogy, a swimming analogy. Like, so if we're comparing like a lot of yardage sets, so, like 3000 yards, just like straight up swimming, if we compare that to solo queue and then like sprint sets, which focus on sprinting, uh, to like other types of, of other types of improvement and learning, like grindy grindy sets, they're good, really good for like distance swimmers, right? And um, sprint sets are better for sprinters, right? But you want to do grindy sets for both types of people, but just some people improve from doing a lot of like yardage often, right? But like as a sprinter, you're not going to improve from doing a lot of yardage often. So my thing is that it's obvious in basically every other sport that people learn differently, but I feel like people don't understand that in the league community. Like not everybody learns from just grinding solo queue nonstop, right? I, don't know, I, I would say we have plenty of a... sprinters in solo queue. Yeah, yeah. Plenty of, plenty you stole of that sprinters from Papa. in solo queue. You said that in chat. Wow, you stole it. <laughs> I, had get, I had to get him back after he went after you for Conti no reason. Continue, continue. Um, so like kind of the TLDR of my point is there's absolutely things that NA pros can do to improve, but people trying to call them out without considering all of the public information is super bad faith and players are bound to lash out about it. And also like, think about your criticism before leveling it at competitors that you don't really know that much about. Um, so one, I appreciate this take. I have a couple things that I have to say, uh, I guess. I'm going to go backwards to the list. The way that people practice and learn differently is absolutely true. There's a plenty of research on this um, outside of competitive things too, just like learning in general. Um, and I think the thing I'll say in the league ecosystem is that the players who are able to win world championships without playing pretty egregious amounts of solo queue is the exception more than the norm. So I don't think that that is... Like I don't, I wouldn't point to Barrel and be like, just be like Barrel, guys. You know, like oh. um, because, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but I think some people uh, do do take this uh, perspective where it's like, if you interviewed the majority of world champion players and asked how much did you play League of Legends every they played day, a lot, yeah, most of them played like 14 to 16 hours plus. Some of them absolutely disgusting amounts. Um, going all the way back to like 2013 through like 2014, 15. I remember reading interviews by the Samsung guys, Samsung White, Samsung Blue, uh, Samsung Galaxy, T1, you know, like just all the way almost like doing big guys. Like not every single one on every team is like this. There is a spectrum, um, but almost all of them put in pretty insane hours, except for the rare exceptions like Barrel. And so while some people can do that, it doesn't seem to be the norm that you can reach the heights that Beryl has reached with his methodology. Um, Absolutely. Few people have been able to do that. I completely agree that there's not a lot of people that can do that, but I think it was it was less of like a normal thing and more of a, this is an example of somebody who succeeded by doing something different. And that's why I don't flame fudge for like the 1v1 practice a ton. I, I think there are times where he should have been making advantage or making use of the other tools available. Like I would have liked to have seen him in champs queue before being zero three. Yes. Yeah, so I was going to say he joined up right before the, <laughs> the final day or whatever. Yeah. But like, but like the majority of his practice being one V ones, I don't hate that uh, necessarily. Um, and like, you know, it was working for him. He, he was the best top in North America, you know? And so like, not, not for the entire year, but for like portions of it, you know, doing his practice methodology. And so I don't, I don't yeah. universally want to trash, trash fudge. I do think that when the moment came, I wouldn't mind seeing him try and get some international experience in Champions Cube, but yeah. I mean, just add on to that as well. It's worth saying that 
a lot of the approach to Champions Q, and maybe we can go into Champions Q topic a bit later, um, is that pros, NA pros ask for Champions Q, and now that they've got it, they don't use it. But it's worth saying that I didn't see Fudge ask for Champions Q. Like, to my to my knowledge, it's people like Doublelift who ask for Champions Q, right? And, you know, in fairness to Doublelift, he has grinded Champions Q basically more than almost any other player in the region, right? So if he was to become a pro, as is rumored, you know, and then he suddenly stopped playing Champions Q, it would be appropriate to question, you know, why he asked for it and then didn't use it, right? No, but, but you know, Peter, I think yeah? it's I think it's fair that like uh, we for like a decade or close to it, we heard all the players say like solo queue sucks. That's why we don't do it. Blah 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 blah. And then people are like, okay, cool. Here we've presented this opportunity. And then when you don't see, I don't look. Yeah, you're right. Maybe people shouldn't target fudge, but I do think it's fair for fans to be frustrated when they're like, wait, this tool that everybody thought was going to be really great just isn't getting used by you guys because you don't want to be on voice comms like i think it's a fair frustration yeah but i mean you know i think that there's, there's a point there's a wider point you've made here which is that i think that maybe fans and i've said this multiple times have the wrong impression of what champions q should be useful um in my opinion you know champions q isn't is a tool amongst many tools that have been lacking in north america for many years for upcoming people to challenge for places at the top, right? It's an it's an access point for new people coming up, right? And putting the problem that North America has had for many years is that the the bottom up pressure on the top pros has basically been non-existent. Now, there's many reasons why this happened, right? But you can say imports, imports, imports. You can say, you know, all kinds of other things. But it's very clear that the opportunities for pros for, for potential pros coming up through the NO ecosystem just hasn't existed you know it's five fire in europe if like would would have there's no world where five fire wouldn't have been given an academy spot like a full-time academy spot before kind of he's retired or doing whatever he's doing but he's not playing league of legends full-time anymore right he won literally everything in amateur for multiple years and he, he never got a shot right and in any other region except maybe korea right but if you're like a really, really talented upcoming player in Korea and you don't get a shot in the Korean league, you go to you go to LDL, you go to like PCS, you go to all these other options, right? But if you were in Europe, you would go to an ERL team. If you were in um, uh, if you were in LPL, you wouldn't have to go through the academy system. You could go and join uh, one of the other teams in LDL who are not affiliated to to an LPL organization, and you would just beat those guys and demonstrate your skill level, right? But there was no option for players like him to, to come up and demonstrate their skill level, right? And this is what Champions Q and the new Proving Ground formats allows for, right? Now, the problem is when you, when you are the top player in your region, right? Every amount of effort you put in to get better is... <laughs> so when you're at the top uh, of, of, a, of a skill set, it's very hard to learn more. It's very hard to learn. Right, it, like the amount of effort you put in for each percentage point of improvement is much lower than somebody who's practicing against you, right? Um, and this is, you know, it's it's just true in all industries, right? You can learn through duplication, you can learn through imitation, and things like this, right? So generally, you know, when a, when you want when a region wants to be competitive, it's generally the people who are coming up and pressuring the people at the top, you know, threatening to take their jobs, threatening to challenge them for titles, for other awards. You know, those are the people who in any other region would be challenging the top pros. And that's what Champions Q does, right? Champions Q gives you an outlet. If you are one of those people and you want to come and improve, it gives you the option. It gives you an improvement tool. Now, it's... Do wait, does Q it though? Sorry sorry to cut yeah. in, Peter. But like, I, I'm, I'm a little confused because like, I don't feel like Champions Q is so exclusive that it doesn't really allow many people to challenge the top, right? Like, I mean, I think it's too exclusive, right? I, I think that the problem with Champions Q right now is it's is it's trying to fill a number of different roles. To me, to be honest, for me, Champions Q is kind of a reward for amateur players for competing in the amateur circuit. I mean, that's how it looks like right now because the top 16 amateur teams are the only amateur players who get to go there. Even if you're like a, you know, an, an insane solo queue player, you have no access to Champions Q unless you compete in the amateur circuit, right? Whereas what it should be is um, it should be a tool for people to get themselves noticed, tool for people who want to grind to be able to grind, 
And the problem is that because of the bottlenecks on certain roles, right, if you are a solo laner, you can play as much champion skew as you want, right? But if you're a jungler, you're an AD carry or support, you can't. And obviously at Worlds, they found answers to this, right? They found um, priority queue, and I assume priority queue will be introduced into champions queue next year, right? Um, but, but exactly, right? The, the, I think what fans want to see from champions queue is they want to see Bjergsen playing against Jensen every single night, you know, and seeing who's better and having, you know, really hype team games, right? But that's not generally what's going to happen over the course of the season because it's not anonymous. Right, um, but I, the, the thing I'd push back on a little bit is it's not just fans who seem to want that identity for Champions Q. It seems like a, a non-negligible portion of the vocal pros want yeah. Champions Q to be a low Q time, but really only the best players in, <laughs> yes. around me playing. And the problem is that those people, or not, maybe not them specifically, but there's not enough pros playing consistently. So then you get a lot of amateur and collegiate players trying to be put in there and then that pisses off like this is what core jj was talking about um and like it's just this like vicious cycle where like not enough of the really good pros play um so you get these people who are probably fine but you know get tilted at by the pros who are still playing and it's a low quality game in their mind and then they don't want to play champions queue and then they leave and so like either you lower the floor further to get realistic or like good queue times or and then when when the good pros come back they're pissed off because this fucking no name is in Champions Q now who came from the ladder. And so like I think the problem that Champions Q has a little bit is an identity crisis between being a discovery tool and a proving circuit, which is what I think you want it to be and what pros want it to be, not just fans, but pros want it to just be 100 players from academy and LCS only, but then most of them don't play it enough for that to be the the cutoff. But do all pros yeah. want to do that, right? Like there's there's some pros that want that and those guys play a lot in Champions Q. Core JJ plays a ton of Champions Q. Right, River plays a ton of Champions Q. Um, Closer plays a ton of Champions Q, right? But it doesn't necessarily mean that all pros wanted to be that. Right, we have to be really, really careful about tiring all pros with one brush because you know they're not all the same person from the same point of view, and they're not all hypocrites. Right, if you treat the entire body of pros as a single as a single voice with a single unitary uh, opinion, then it's very easy to say this is hypocritical. But it's not every single person who's saying that. And the people who are saying that want it to be one thing. And I think this is what the, this is the problem you have with Champions League right now, because it does have an identity crisis. It's not clear what it's for. And, you know, if you want it to be a practice tool for pros, flood the thing with with players and then have priority queue, right? Like make make pros have higher priority. Academy players have secondary priority. Academy and LLA pros have secondary priority. And then you won't have the queue times. You'll have shorter queue times, right? For, for the people that want to practice with essentially players playing Phil, right? Like uh, amateur players playing Phil. But that's not what it is right now. Everyone has equal priority. People queue in different roles. And you get situations where the queue times are really, really long because, you know, half half the good mid laners aren't even in Champions League because they didn't play in the proving round circuit to get in. And so, so you have like six mid laners holding up 14 supports or something like this, right? So, and that, that causes longer queue times, which makes people less interested, right? Del so, so you need to have, you need to be really clear about what this is a tool for doing. And for me, what I've seen by being in other regions is the way that people, the way that people push for, at the top is not, it's very, very rarely top down. You know, it's people from the bottom having tools to get into the system and force their way up. You know, this is one of the reasons why, you know, I, I've enjoyed working with rookies so much for, for my entire career. It's because those guys are the guys that have come up, said, thought, OK, I can be better than this. I'm going to do it. And then they're very motivated and then they come in and raise the bar. And you see this happen in Europe with people like Humanoid, people like Kaiser. You see it happen in NA with people like Jojo. And that's the thing that NA, that's one of the things that NA has been missing because people, there's always been a bottleneck in from amateur to academy and then from academy to lcs and this is one of the tools to help alleviate that that bottleneck in my opinion even if it's not what other people seem to want peter i just want to let delphi get a word in because she wanted to say something about five minutes ago uh delphi what were you gonna say well, um i kind of for no I, I didn't really forget but it's kind of not relevant anymore um it was like after mark was talking about how a lot of or like pros didn't want to play against like um i just remember from a player stream he was like yeah some of my teammates were saying like they don't want to play against like collegiate and amateur shitters and champions queue and that's why they didn't play 
And then when those, and then I remember a later stream, he was like, the same teammate was complaining about longer queue times, which is kind of just like kind of backing up Mark's yeah, point. Yeah, because pro like, players are dumb, and I'm doing what yeah. I'm not supposed <laughs> to do and generalize them all. But like, they don't they don't sit there and think logically about it. They're just like, oh, this feels match. bad. Here's why it feels bad. In any given moment, whatever yeah. made them feel bad is the problem. So it feels bad that I have a queue time. It feels bad that my teammate's not a pro player. And it's like, do you realize these are correlated? Yeah. No. Yeah, of not. it's definitely a. But um, I, I can talk about pros and that yeah, stuff. I, I, but I, I mean, uh, there's there's so much to dig into here. I, I mean, I, we could go forever on just this one call. I feel like because um, yeah, the, the the pro player angle is one that I think you know they're under fire right now, and I don't want to pour more gasoline on the fire. But there is, I think, some truth to um, a, a lot of all this this stuff, both in terms of like. Well, I mean, I think one thing that that Peter said that I thought was really smart was they like pro players are not a monolith you cannot just say lcs pro players there's like 50 of them right and then you have all the people in academy and i was talking to some pro players about this off the well not off the record but just like not anonymously i guess and asking them I'm like okay on, you know tell me no camera in front of you just tell me what you think of all this and they're like yeah i think it's very disingenuous because people just sort of say all pro players are these lazy people that aren't doing anything in North America. On the other hand, like this person's sat in on teams before where they saw pro players like not solo queuing and getting got very frustrated by it, right? And I think that's one of the challenges is uh, that people should recognize is you have a pretty wide spectrum of people putting in effort and motivation into this league and it must suck pretty bad to be somebody who's like grinding 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 maybe you're on a team where other people are not grinding you miss worlds you feel bad and then you go online and everybody's just like you're fucking lazy even though you've sacrificed yeah. like a shit ton of time well, and stress and energy and psych you know s psychological health to the blood gods and then people are like you didn't bleed enough uh not yeah, for my amazing. entertainment oh. I mean, I, I will say that this is like, uh, it's it's a funny thing to correlate to like the wider ecosystem of like America, I guess, like the entire Oh boy, country. here but we like go. Anytime, any, any, I'm just saying anytime you point out systematic issues, there are of course people where those like, the, you're not who we're talking about. Um, and like the not all pros, not all this, not all that. I won't say the, the group names, everyone knows I'm talking about to, just to avoid turning this political, but like you know, those people always chime in like, well, not me, guys. And it's like, great, we weren't talking about you. We're talking about like the, the broader problems that exist in the ecosystem systematically, you know, like, um, and I think for those pros who are putting in the hours and are um, working hard, you know, it feels bad to feel like you're getting lumped in with that same group. But like, you know, that you, you put the work in and that this doesn't apply to you. Um, and I, I think uh, it can sometimes detract from the conversation when you, you that kind of stuff. Yeah. Do, do people yeah. know that Vulcan is one of those pros that was putting in the work? Because it doesn't seem like they do. No, they don't. Because He's this is not. the frustrating thing. Like, the, this is one of the reasons I hate this conversation is because fans and the community are not interested in nuance. They are not interested in like looking and seeing which teams are are players. All they are are angry. And so Worlds comes around and they go, "Oh, we lost. That's a bummer." And then. Lyra and Rigby come out and talk about this giant fucking thread. People narrow in on one part of it. Vulcan, you know, unfortunately for himself and the other pros, adds some fire to that by being frustrated about it. And then, like, you go on Twitter, and, uh, you know, the great example of this was Medios tweeted, like, oh, I'm just so tired of seeing about this conversation every year. It's so exhausting. I retweeted it, and then my feed was full of a bunch of people like, of course pro players are tired of hearing about it because you guys are all lazy. It must suck to hear about how lazy you are at your job when you're just trying to paycheck steal and stuff. And I'm just like, like, and and again, I realize that that's similarly not the not entire community, but it is exhausting because I don't actually think there are nuanced conversations happening about this. And people just want a resident sleeper through it and then wait till next year when they can be like, yeah, you guys are fucking lazy and be like well, upset about it. You oh, know? I, I agree. But 
like if if you don't mind, could I talk about like the the Cloud Templar earlier? Sure, yeah, yeah. Second? Sure. yeah, yeah. I tweeted this about is, this. This is gonna be eighty percent of the conversation tonight, so let's just <laughs> dig into all of it now. Yeah. Okay, um, I tweeted about this, and I'm not gonna go super in depth about it, but um, it was insane to me that they talked about like systematic issues within management and coaching, and then like if you read the Reddit post, like the solo queue part, the players not playing solo queue part was maybe like. 10% of that post and that was the only freaking thing that anybody wanted to talk about I was like this dude just said like coaches are actually incompetent and cannot like cannot coach their players properly yes. and you guys want to talk about solo queue it was insane because like obviously we know like we can see the player solo queue counts whatever whatever but like that was a conversation brought to, brought by a former coach and nobody wanted to talk about it it was so it was so strange to me that people just narrowed in on that one part that, that's what I was saying is that my blame game talk was initially going to be about coaching and kind of like the rest of that that post before it got kind of consumed by the, the pro player thing. Um, the final thing I'll say, just to backtrack a little bit to what Travis was saying about like the lack of nuance, I will say, and we have other takes about Vulcan and stuff, so I feel bad that like I'm probably eating some of the callers topics here, but like we're driving, so let's just Just set going. it up. Like, You're bridging to the next call, Mark. That's a, it's a segue. Uh, sure. My segue is that pro players don't do themselves any favors when you respond to the criticism in this way. If you want nuance, you have to give nuance. And I love Vulcan. He's one of my favorite people in the whole scene. I don't think he's an idiot or a bad person. Like you said, he's probably frustrated reading this shit and he just fired off a tweet. Everyone's done that before. I have made really bad tweets. But like, I can't get mad at my audience for me sticking my foot in my mouth. So, like, Mark, on you, that point, if you want nuance, you have to give nuance. Do you think, Mark, that it would be helpful if teams produced... I, I mean, I could just say content and then end the sentence there, but uh, I was going to say anything that shows anything about how much of a challenge it is content. to fucking go somewhere. And again, I'm not saying they need a weekly documentary show, but when here's here's the, here's the fan experience. To defend the fans, here's the fan experience. Watch LCS... Watch teams play LCS. Never really see much from the teams or the players. <laughs> Watch teams go to Worlds. Watch team lose Worlds. 3-15. <laughs> say nothing. <laughs> go 3-15. Teams, players, say nothing other than whoopsie. Shut the fuck up, Steve. Po post, post no content. Have no, <laughs> Refuse to elaborate. And then go to the next year to do this again. And like... <laughs> I just like I think there's a world where fans could become more sympathetic if you pry, cry, try to create any kind of relatability or sympathy for the actual grind that these players do go through. Because right now, like I know what it's like. Peter knows what it's like. Mark knows what it's like. Fans don't know what it's like because they get nothing that tells or explains or reveals any of it. So I don't know. Fuck the teams that decide not to do content. I guess. Um, I all agree. Right. Uh, a just, final olive branch. I've got one side point I want to pay on this. Firstly, you know, whenever people try to say things like this, they get shit on, right? Like, I remember Danny and Spring Split getting really, like, some of the stuff that Danny was getting in Spring Split before playoffs was, like, unacceptable stuff to send, to, uh, to send an 18 year old kid. It's just, like, unacceptable to do that kind of thing, like, from what I was seeing. Uh, he never made a big deal about it, but, you know, sometimes you see things when you're over somebody's shoulder. Um, and, like, that kind of thing, like, I mean, Holy moly. Um, and it's more socially acceptable to do some of those things in North America for some reason. I, I've got no idea where it is. Um, but, um, oh, fudge, there was an important point I was, wanted to make it. Okay, but, but when you're talking about who should be putting in the effort, right? Like, I think it's, you know. Wait, Peter was trying to wind like down a, the call and you're just opening up a whole other segment. Uh, but, no, no, but, but this, is, this will be the last thing and then I promise I'll draw it to a close. Like, the, within a region, the what you the way the thing that pushes the region forward right is how hard the teams that are challenging for the top challenge people at the top right and you know when again i just stress this again because this is stuff that rigby has said this is stuff which you know the eg players are too you know self-conscious to go and say although i should think that they should you know highlight how much they work right in spring split no team worked harder than eg that is why eg got to the top and that's why eg won in spring split in summer split you know there was literally one day gap between Houston and flying to Korea. And then we had to be, after four days after MSI, after we were eliminated for MSI, we had to be back to do Riot 
like content right after like four days five days break um from the end of msi and then there's an expectation that these guys should go and push us hard like that's absurd like the calendar is completely absurd for teams that go to, to msi and then despite all of this i go and see my team working you know really really hard um, like i said clg tl eg the, were the three hardest working teams in summer and then i see these guys working hard than, than harder than players on other teams that should be challenging them, that should be pushing them day to day, that should be pushing them in Champions Queue, that should be pushing them in scrims, that should be pushing them on stage, not give a shit. And then who's the one that's being targeted? It's Vulcan. It's a complete disgrace. Okay, and like that's that's what I would say on this topic. You know, you're the the community is targeting the wrong people because the people who are willing to say anything are the ones like anybody puts their head over the parapet, they get immediately targeted. Right, we, and that is very, very, very frustrating to see as somebody who knows what's going on behind the scenes. And that's the last thing I said about uh, So that combo well with what was my going to be my final thing too, as I was going to say. Well, you already gave a final of, thing. No, I didn't. You literally I said, extend, "Here's no, my final thing." I'm going to extend an olive branch. Is what I is okay. my final thing to, to the pro players because I was bagging on them a little bit earlier. The olive branch I'll give is that anytime I have tried to um, go on the side of pro players and how hard they work, um, people often don't want to hear it. And they just assume you're wrong or that you don't know what you're talking about as if I don't know people with normal jobs as well. <laughs> you know, like... Dude, the Reddit like thread where the person industries. was like, Vulcan shows up, gets to do whatever at 10, 10 a.m. Yeah. And then like... Vulcan so, pulls his pants off and plays scrims, whereas so, working working man Steve spends three hours in a commute. Yeah, and like, yeah, exactly. I'm just like, like, that was the stupidest numbers, thing I've ever read on Reddit. Oh. Anything involving facts just go out the window when you have this conversation. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. I forget the context I tweeted this initially, but like I, I, I was just like pushing back on the idea that pro players are lazy. I think there's an argument to be had about working as hard as your contemporaries, which are the other people in other regions, which is a different conversation than just calling pro players lazy, which is what I don't like doing. And pro players can be made fun of for a lot of reasons, but the vast majority of them do put in. And this was the tweet that like people started arguing with me about. So I said the vast majority of pro players put in more work than the average person. Um, and you can link the numbers for average work hours in America by different sectors, by different, you know, like levels. And like, for the most part, pro players are going to be bigger than that. And like, People just get offended that you use numbers and like actual things. Um, and like, I don't, this is not me calling those other people lazy. I'm not saying you're lazy for having whatever schedule you have, but like uh, anytime that you try and explain the, the, the pro player angle of like how intense the grind is in season, especially when you're in a team's position like Peter's team, um, where you're, you're flying across the country and not at home and like, you know, doing all this stuff, not across the country, but across the world and whatnot, like, um, I, I think people uh, don't don't understand that. And then again, it boils down to other things because you make this one claim, and then people move the goalposts. Like it's happening to Twitch chat. Most people aren't working a passion job. It's like great. I didn't say that. I just meant purely in terms of like amount of time. Amount yeah. of time. It's the only number I'm using. It's the only thing I'm talking about. You can bring whatever other things you want to bring in. Don't move the goalposts. I said one thing. <sighs> Anyways, that, that's, that's my olive branch, is that it's very hard to get the people who are on the outside to appreciate the work that goes on the inside. I see it in Twitch chat right now. It's so annoying. Okay. Yeah, pe Delfino. people just take it as a personal attack if you if you cite numbers. Delfino, anything that you want to say as we move on to a quick break? Oh, um, like, I definitely think it's really unfair to pros, but I feel like there's not a lot of nuance given. I agree with that. Anyway, um, I want to shout out Maya, LCS Miracle on Twitter. She's making really cool graphics for all the teams, so you should definitely give her all your leaks. Um, and I Honestly, also want to shout the teams should just contract her out because the C9 one yeah. that I saw was really, really good. It's it's really good. She's really talented. Um, and I also want to shout out myself, obviously, December OLI on Twitter, and I want to shout out the Anyman podcast. Um, but we're having a fun episode this week. Is you have, um, do you know who the guest is? I don't know who the guest is. Does Peter Dunn know who the guest is? No, sorry. <laughs> okay. I, Delphi, I, Delphi, at this point in time, no, I'm not sure if Peter Dunn actually does, does know. know who the guest is. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little worried for you. what he signed up for. Yeah. Peter just said yes to every single person who was like, want to be on our podcast, and he did zero research on any of them. Yeah. He has no idea what he's real. He's going to be appearing on Joe Rogan later this week and be discussing... Uh, with, with he's a, like, wait, where the fuck am I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But Peter, you don't think your players should get vaccinated, right? Okay, anyway, thank you so much, Delphi, for the call. Yay.
And uh, we'll catch you next time. Okay. So. I love love how quickly my point was proved as well when I said what I said and Twitch chat exploded about it. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Exactly. It was, was, thank you guys. I also, like, it's so disingenuous too because, like, as much as, like, I think Vulcan's point, though poorly phrased, like, I understand where it comes from because, like, the Reddit poster who's, like, defending this theoretical Steve that exists out there is also not Steve. Like, this Steve or whoever it is that the Reddit poster is creating, they don't have time to go. If they're working as hard as these people will think, they're not spending all their time on Reddit arguing about this shit and reading what Vulcan's tweeting in the middle of the week and well, coming out and writing these giant things. Like to, to defend the guy who wrote the Steve thing, too, like, he was responding to Vulcan initially. Uh, I'm sure Vulcan read a lot of things that, like, pissed him off and whatever that that yeah, Lyra yeah. thread was with uh rigby and stuff um but again like I, it's just one of those things where i think both sides are making pretty pretty poor points um and <laughs> yeah. I, I have i have no horse in the race exactly because i'm like I, i'm not on a team anymore um and my job is to just try and communicate my thoughts on the situation but like yeah it's yeah. a mess it's, it's always a mess yeah okay uh by the way before i do this quick ad i just want to say I think it's very, I, I want to, uh, I think her name is Mira uh, that Delphi was mentioning, but if, I, maybe I can go find this. I don't, I, I don't Mira, but they, they made like a really, really cool, maybe one of the, the name and people can post it in the chat. They made a really, really awesome graphic about like the C9 roster. And I think that they're Maya, it's Maya. Uh, and I think that they're going to do one for all of the, team rosters as they get like basically as as locked in as they normally are and i just think it's fascinating that like this is cooler than a lot of the stuff that i see come out from teams i'm gonna see if i can put it on the on the screen right now and i think that this is in my opinion like the next wave of the lcs as we see teams like start to not invest in content and not invest in like creating cool things from the I don't know for, for on their own things. Like I feel like fans are just going to have to pick up the slack, which feels kind of shitty, but also like people cool. forget that this whole scene was built off of grassroots community stuff. And so I just like, it's, I'm probably going to, I know I always say I'm probably gonna make a video about this, but like, I do think that there's something to be said here about guys. Like these teams are pulling back on a bunch of shit that they shouldn't be. And so I'm hopeful that all of you open up and start helping to make sure that the scene keeps going. Cause to, to pile onto that too not. like yeah a lot of the iconic league videos were not made by teams or like personalities they were made by random community members who had a cool idea and made the thing like the double if man of steel video like that wasn't made by anyone right that was yeah. just like a, some some you, random I, I shouldn't call them a random but like you know and then like some of these people do turn out like g bay ended up becoming like a league personality but a lot a lot of like those og content things were just people doing what they wanted at first many of you are more creative and more committed and more invested than the people that seemingly are working in and running this industry at this point in time. Travis so, and I just fucking show up and collect some money for this podcast. Exactly. Exactly. And we're actually creating content. So think about all the people that aren't, uh, or the teams and companies that how are much, How much lazier they are. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Uh, Travis Gafford wakes up at 6 a.m. in the morning. Meanwhile, I don't know, whoever at whatever team. I actually teams, do wake up at 6 in the morning, yeah. and I make... Ashley breakfast and I drive her to work and I come home. All right. We don't need to hear and I day in the life Twitter of Mark Zimmerman for three hours. But, uh, but I just, I, all I'm saying, I'm trying to inspire the people out there to, uh, show up and embarrass riot games and the companies in the space that are not doing as much as they could by your own amazing talents. Uh, cause I know I believe in many of you. All right. But not all of you. Anyway, let's talk about Alienware, a company I completely believe in because right now I'm using their Alienware X14, which is actually, can I show, I don't know how much space I have on these cables, but like this computer right here, this is what the whole thing is being run off of right now. Look how thin and wonderful and delightful this computer is. I'm holding it with one hand. It is. That's an entire control room right there. Yes, this is, this is the control room for this show. Uh, which is actually, industries. it's kind of, if it's actually kind of impressive. Um, so I just would go check them out. Uh, alienware.com says Travis, they sponsor, 
us and their hardware is actually awesome. I mean, like the computers, we we have yet to drop a frame. Now, sometimes when you drop frames, it's from the hotel internet. So if we do later, it's possibly that. But I'm looking at XSplit, and it's like not even maxing out the CPU and the GPU. And it's, you know, the fans are going pretty strong right now, but they're not. It's not super loud. It doesn't feel like it's going to take off or anything like that. So, uh, I don't know. I I just go check out the X14. It is my favorite notebook I have ever had. I was kind of nervous that it would it might struggle for this show, but it's doing fantastic. And uh, they're going to have a bunch, I'm sure, as always, Black Friday deals coming up uh, if they're not already up on the site by the time that you're looking at this. Going to alienware.com slash Travis. Please, if you're purchasing something from them this holiday season through this Black Friday, whatever, alienware.com slash Travis, if you use that link, a portion of that goes back to TGI, and that's very much appreciated. So thank you so much to Alienware for sponsoring the show. Mark Zimmerman, would you like to go grab at 8 no, o'clock just... our next caller? <laughs> Off he goes. Uh, thank you to Invert, Wrath of Khan. Oh, I said some of these folks already. Uh, Robert Bruce. Uh, Numi gifted another one. Tree Bird. Numi's just giving me back the money that I gave her for working and uh, that's funny. Okay, Jay Schroed, uh Spencer Neutron for 56 months, the Master Mellow Jello, and it looks like Mark is still not here. Uh, Kanoke, Pokemans, uh, Puprup, who subbed and then gifted five subs. And right. I Ica's here. Ica, where are you calling from? Most important question of the night, are we going Scarlet or are we going uh, Violet? Pokemans, uh, what are we doing? Scarlet. Scarlet, yes. No, just kidding, Violet. Wait, Violet's the future. Which stops us? Wait, is this <coughs> green cat? Is this I Ica? Ica your name says Ica on my screen. Are you some something else? Uh, no, I'm Ica. That's okay, like, yeah. Mark was screaming about Pokemans or something, so I was confused. Okay, where are you, you calling from, Caller? When I came in, where are you calling from, this. Caller? Uh, West Virginia. West Virginia. Okay, and what do you want to talk about in the show? Uh, I believe. That uh, if my, the mindset of Vulcan is the mindset players have at large, then we should simply focus on the LCS as an entertainment product, uh, separate from the world stage. Okay, so when you say the mindset of Vulcan is the mindset of players at large, you mean like North American players or global players? North American players. Uh, I think <clears throat> the LCS uh, has a lot of financial incentive for players to prolong their career, and that may not necessarily be the best path towards being the best uh necessarily and i think with that in mind and with the given state of you know current state of play it makes a lot more sense for the lcs to gear itself towards being a bit more um i want to say self-important but i understand that seems kind of uh you know looking inward i'm guessing what you mean it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like, looking it's inward, really about i mean focusing on the like have the prestige of the league be winning the league not going to worlds and going three and fifteen um, okay. And when you talk about financial incentives, can you dive into that a little bit more? Cause I am kind of curious what you mean. I mean, I don't think you can blame a player like Vulcan for not burning themselves at both ends of the candle. If it means giving up a high six to low seven figure salary for another year or two. You know, I think like, uh, Oh, go ahead. I mean, I, I wouldn't do it. And I don't think anyone in chat can honestly say they'd do it. No, they would all tell you that they'll, they would do it. Uh, okay. So the, lie. you don't get it. Yeah. Uh, they just can't because they're working their six to midnight job. Oh my God. Travis is picking a fight with. <laughs> no, I just find that, that analogy stuff so disingenuous. Um, no, but okay. I, I think one of the things that's confusing to me about this take is like, even if, even in a world where the LCS was isolated from global play, like we just decided we were never, we're never going to compete in an international <laughs> event again you would still have significant financial incentives to be the best in the league because the delta between the payments that go to players on the top teams versus players that go that are like hanging out on the bottom teams, I can tell you is quite significant. Um, sure. And so sure. I think that's what's, that's, what's a little confusing to me. It also kind of assumes that like Vulcan is, I don't know. I, I whatever. I don't want to get into. Like, well, Travis, this whole post, let me but... let me ask you. Did you read Vulcan's follow up one a.m. thoughts? Yes. Tweet? Yes. Where he was like, I mean, so he was talking about like, yes, I could do all this. Yes, I could do all this, but uh, at what cost? And essentially implying that like 
he might lose shorten his career by a year or whatever yeah i think that's kind of the caller's point more so is that like if you're the best in in your region um and you're you're beating everyone and like you could over the course of a split spend two more hours every single day or something and sleep less or not do the thing that relaxes you or or whatever um but vulcan's saying that it's going to probably shorten my career if i do that um isn't this kind of see i guess i find even the logic of that a little confusing because these guys do get challenged by each other, right? Like we see so much roster mobility every year that if like, why is it that sh shouldn't the core, core JJs of the league be forcing Vulcan to, to practice harder? Or is that your point, Ika, that like everybody's kind of just satisfied if they can get top three or four, they're <clears> just satisfied with that. They're not going to push harder. I, I do think that's the case. I think they're kind of satisfied with a certain level of play that will continue to uh, net a paycheck, um, which is fine. Like, again, I can't blame them. And, you know, truthfully, I don't think the league uh, is set up for them to be able to challenge, like, the DRXs of the world or the T1s of the world. I just don't think that's something that's practical, at least not consistently. Uh, and so with that in mind, I think taking some of the edge off of that and shifting the focus towards entertainment as opposed to just trying to be the best would be... Uh, better for the players, and I think it would be better for the league. Because, uh, you know, frankly, at this point, anyone who's left caring about Worlds is... I mean, come on. <laughs> it has to be a little bit brutal at this point. Um, so there, there's two parts to this. There's obviously the, like, what should the league's overarching angle be? Um, and then there's also kind of like what Vulcan's saying. Um, to, to finalize my thoughts on what Travis is talking about, like the Vulcan thing, I think people put in v variable amounts of effort across the season depending on if they're losing a lot if they're winning a lot if they feel challenged or not um if it's playoff crunch time if it's the middle of the season um you know players will prioritize different things and uh it's not like they're just consistently doing the same thing across the entire year um and i, I think to vulcan's point some of the the people who are talking about this kind of mental health angle and protecting the longevity of their career it's that going full throttle as much as you can possibly handle 100 percent of the time is more likely to cause a crash then I don't, I don't want to say coasting, but like uh, finding the moments in time where you can let off the gas a little bit and hopefully head into those higher period of times more refreshed. Um, whereas in, as I understand it, a lot of the LCK teams, it's basically full throttle all the time. And if you're not doing that, they'll just find someone else who will. Um, not everyone, not all teams, of course, there are differences, but like, um, if core jj there, there's a video that everyone i'll shout it out again at some other point but the interview and i'm sorry to do this travis but the interview with ashley kang and core jj is like every north american fan needs to watch that video it well, is I, like, I, like I, I have no issue it, it almost 100 percent aligns with my thoughts on the situation it doesn't cover the entire ecosystem question but it does give like an insider's opinion who has been there at the top in both north america and korea and can talk about the differences of the scenes and has very insightful answers core jj is just a very intelligent human being he's very eloquent and that video is like going to give you more context than anything else is going to. So watch that video. And I think that's just like my perspective a little bit is like Vulcan saying there's times where, you know, he could maybe ease off the gas a little bit and that'll help him in the long run. Um, uh, and maybe, you know, that, that's what he's prioritizing over like full throttle 100% of the time until he, he crash out some burnouts. Whereas in Korea, everyone does that. And then the people who just have like the mental edge of like some people just don't get burned out as easily. Like Caps is someone in the West doesn't burn out as easily. Um, Faker seems to not burn out as easily. Like those players are the only ones who can change sustainability there. I mean, I think also it's worth just going on the world's point. Like I think that domestic success should be valued higher because Worlds is not a level playing field. And this is what people don't realize, right? There's systematic, unique, let's call them qualities within each system, which, which handicap, like what you're seeing at Worlds is, is it's a contest of teams, but it's also like a, an indication of structural um, differences within the regions, right? Um, and, you know, if there are, is a certain region that is at a disadvantage, let's say North America, for instance, or let's say Brazil, you know, these are isolated regions. They have no, um, the structural issues in North America are very, very, very serious. You know, winning, being able to win in that, in those circumstances is something which should be celebrated. 
you know, and sometimes, how would I say this? You wouldn't expect Denmark to win the World Cup, right? Like you, and I think that maybe, maybe people in in North America have been sold for a lot of time that you know uh, NA is Brazil and NA is not Brazil in League of Legends, um, and that doesn't mean it can't be entertaining. It doesn't mean that it can't be. It doesn't mean that there's no value in North America, but you know, until you put the structures in place to make your to make your um, league as efficient or as groundbreaking or as innovative as as those other regions, it's very very difficult to compete with those other regions. Um, on Vulcan's point about burnout, you know, if people think that you know this is this is the practice schedule which has gotten Vulcan to the top, right? Like as far as he can reasonably go, because remember, there's only two international tournaments a year. If if there's such a problem with that structure, why has nobody come and taken his position from him, right? Why is Vulcan like? I don't think there's anyone that say would say that Vulcan is not a top two supported NA, right? So you know, if you want to have, if you don't think that Vulcan deserves his job, or you don't like how Vulcan goes in positions, then find the next person and champion the next person who will behave in the way that you want to, to come and challenge him and come and take his spot, right? And, you know, I've said this before on the Champions Q topic, it's not easy within certain systems for people to find international success, and it's not as simple as saying it's a cultural issue, right? It's it's just not. So I, I'm sorry if that's not a very detailed um, response to that topic, but that, I mean, that's just my opinion. I just continue to think it's um, a false dichotomy. What do you think about... Uh, to the caller's other point about like pivoting at least how the broadcast and the ecosystem around it talks about it um, to focus less on the world's angle and the competition. Um, because like you said, we're not Brazil, but there's also, I feel like a lot of the traditional comparisons don't hold up in the sense that like there are alternative products readily available to English speaking audiences who want to watch competitive League of Legends. Um, <clears throat> yes, there are some time zone barriers for the LCK, but the LCK product is quite good uh, for the English channel. And the LEC exists. Um, and so I, I do think that there is a more worthwhile... It's, it's worthwhile considering the risk of pivoting your product away from the comp competitive angle. Um, I mean, can I quickly throw a point to that? Yes. Um, you guys can hear me, right? Good example on? of that would be like uh, the Canadian Football League exists independent of the NFL and the, you know, like college football championships obviously do very well in ratings. And no one has any illusions that those teams would hold up in a su Super Bowl, right? Like, it's just not the same quality of play. But those leagues do what they can to make those games feel important. And that is something I think the LCS could do better about because I feel like at a certain point, it's like, well, okay, but they made top three, so they made world. So, it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the the ecosystem for uh, collegiate NFL is a can of worms we can get into with, like, alma maters and, like, a lot of stuff like that. But I think, um, is the CFL popular? I have no idea. So, like, this is this is me asking legitimately. Is, is it at all comparable to the NFL? Or do a lot uh, of Canadians who like American football just watch the NFL? Um, I don't know that it is like a one-to-one -one by any stretch, obviously. The NFL is clearly uh, quite a few steps above everything else, even in the sports space. But, I mean, it it does fine. It's been around for probably, I don't know, longer real, than I've been alive. Real quick question, caller. Can you explain to me what, like, your version of the LCS that's focused on entertainment looks like? <clears throat> uh, content. I mean... <laughs> Uh, I don't usually disagree with your take on how the league should prioritize things. I think more content, um, more emphasis on <clears throat> storylines within the league. Uh, I wish teams would quit just swapping rosters around to try and get one more win at Worlds. I'd rather have some continuity so I can actually follow things and enjoy them. Uh, I mean, frankly, the last, I would say, two years, uh, if it weren't for, you know, like, EG being somewhat interesting this year, I really prioritize LEC at this point. Um, I went to the LCS finals this year. I had a lot of fun. Uh, but on the whole, like week to week, um, 
it, I mean, it's it's w- way too difficult to follow, and I don't think the ends justify the means. I uh, like, I, I don't okay. I don't think importing the next best Korean supports going to enthuse me to watch any more than say having consistent rosters and storylines that I can actually invest in. Okay, you know what? I thought for a while that I didn't like your take. You know what? I really like your take. Here's... <laughs> oh my god! No, 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 no. Here we go. So here's the thing. What have we done in the league for a while? We have let, like, teams have given full, from what I understand, full control over to the GMs. And what have the GMs done? They've created rosters that just fucking fail internationally over and over and over again. And we have sacrificed roster stability, content, because, you know, as much as people say, oh, you know, these guys don't work hard enough. If you talk to any of the teams and people like that, it's like, oh, they're working too hard to do content. Um, You have uh, sacrificed, like, the upward mobility of North American players within their own league. You sacrificed all this stuff, and for what? Three and fucking 15. Like, either the GMs are bad at their jobs, or we can't actually do this. Um, And so... I kind of think like maybe it's time to pull back on just going full throttle on like everything competition because if you can't actually pull off more than three and fifteen at worlds, then like why are we why are we sacrificing everything we can so that we can get three wins at group stage? And I, I, I just want to be clear here, Travis, that like I think this take is way too defeatist. I think we're going when I was saying that you know NA is Denmark. I didn't mean that NA cannot win any games at Worlds, right? Like, I'm not saying that we should just give up on... We should give up on... Um... I'm not saying we give up, Peter. But I'm saying maybe we don't need to, like, swap players every five seconds every year because we somehow think that, like, oh, oh, just one more... Just one more import. Please! 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 If I could so, just get not... one more import, I could get out of groups. So so, so, so maybe, maybe I used the wrong analogy by saying... By saying... Um... By saying Denmark, well, what, but let me go with a better example for. for I don't know enough about chat, Denmark right? and what they do, but go ahead. Like, yeah, yeah, but, but okay, let's say the Netherlands. Okay, the the rather than aspiring and behaving as if you are Brazil or as if you are um, Argentina or as if you are Italy, right, or France, NA should behave as if it's the Netherlands, right? And that's smaller population, fewer financial resources. But how does this this country continually push above its weight, right? It finds ways to innovate. It finds really good tools for developing its own talent. It has really good systems in place. It has really good structures. Has huge development and focus on coaching stuff, right? Like like the Netherlands pushes far above its weight uh, internationally in terms of what coaches can contribute, right? And this is how you find success in all conventional sports, right? Like it, it's a pattern that happens time and time and time again, right? How smaller countries with lots of disadvantages against them can compete against the big the big guns at international events um and like my my issue with this with this take is yes i think you should develop on on your own system but look i don't want to treat this as a defeatist take like i think you should stop behaving as if you're brazil start behaving as if you're the netherlands and you know if you understand what the what the what the dutch model is in in football it's very very obvious what the next step is focus on developing your own youth talent have foreigners bring them in as as spice for the team but work on your the fundamental flaws within your development system right like and when when you look at the netherlands and you look at you look at their model what are they doing they're developing young players they're putting investment into coaching staff and they're making sure that there's opportunities for people to rise within the system and that's that for me like that for me is the issue with North America, right? Like, I mean, it's, there's no simple fix to this, right? Like, it's not a one size fits all answer. But the answers that people are coming across is the answers that you would use to solve an issue like the Lakers not being able to win the NBA, or like you know Brazil not being able to win the World Cup, or you know the US not being able to win enough athletics medals at the Olympics, right? Which is not to just throw money at it; it's to fix your infrastructure and to to make sure that you have. A, a infrastructure that develops talent and that promotes opportunities right and like that may seem like a a very simplistic take but this is just how things work in international like in, in international sport you see it time and time again and the wrong solutions keep being proposed because people don't people keep treating north america as if it's on the same level as china and korea which it's not yet 
And that's the, that's an issue. So that's how I would go with this take. I agree with a lot of what you're saying. Uh, I, it pisses me off. Like the most frustrating thing I've ever seen in a single interview is when FBI won the won the LCS and he gave a winner's interview saying that, um, you know, it didn't matter that he just won the S LCS. All he cared about was world. And I just could not believe what I was hearing when I heard that kind of thing. And it indicates the, the, the problem, you know, in viewership retention. If the players don't think it matters, if the orgs don't think it matters, if, then why should the fans give a shit, right? And I think, I think to me, yeah, that's the stance that I have on this subject. Um, I, I disagree completely, Peter. I think we should hire people like Portillo to become the GMs from now on. And instead of looking at solo queue rating, look at engagement on social media platforms and build teams based off that. Uh, yeah. Actually, just hire me and I'll hire content staff instead of the new shiny support looking for a retirement plan. Hey, see this? I think I think we're not too far from each other on all this. Even though we're, you know, everybody here is having big rants and reactions and stuff like that, and chat is all over the place on us. I think we're not too far because I think what we all seem to agree is that the current. Well, I don't. We haven't heard this much from Mark, but what we all seem to agree <laughs> is that the current system is not like actually that tenable, and that the solutions so far have sacrificed the entertainment value of the LCS for not very many wins and not very much success. In fact, not really any success. And Peter is suggesting that the way that we've been trying to do this is not the right way. And I am suggesting that the way we've been trying to do this doesn't work. And so, and so is the caller, it sounds like. So like, it sounds like we all kind of agree. The problem is I don't think that that's what this off season is going to yield. And that's what makes me kind of sad is that I actually just think a lot of, I, I think we are done doing things like let's pay perks a bajillion dollars. I don't think we aren't are done yet with a lot of the other stuff like roster moving dramatically and importing instead importing of native instead talent of native and talent stuff talent. like that. Yeah. I'd say if boost like the way to judge if NA is on the right path is if Boosie and Tenacity are in the LCS playing on good teams. That's what, that's how I would judge it. Yeah. That that's the measure to see if there's any hope for any. If there's if if they're not, then there's I give up. I mean, no they will be in the LCS, but I I don't think you should just focus on those two players, uh Peter. Sure, but I mean just as a just as an example of people that should because I mean they've been blocked for multiple years, right? So sure. Tenacity sure. especially. All right. Uh thank you so much to our caller. Uh we're gonna say goodbye to you. Anything you want to shout out before we say goodbye? Uh, shout out to Peter. He was uh, a lot of the reason I was actually able to watch the LCS this year. Uh, EG was really the only point of interest I had for most of the year. Um, I think it's going to be pretty tough this year <laughs> um, to really find something to sink my teeth into with the product, but here's to hoping. Um, and a shout out to uh, Poppy Fox. Uh, he sat with me at Worlds. Uh, helped me out a bit. Uh, good guy. Thanks. Thank you so much for the call, and we'll catch you next time. Yep, bye. All right. Uh, I think we do... I think we do a Grubhub ad right now, actually. Shout out to Grubhub! Uh, thank you so much to Grubhub for sponsoring Hotline League. I'm probably going to Grubhub stuff right after this, actually, because uh, a lot of things in Salt Lake City close early, uh, at least the stuff in walking distance from where I'm at. So I'm probably going to Grubhub stuff because Grubhub is awesome! Uh, they've been sponsoring us throughout this whole year. We are hopeful that you love them and that you will show that love to them. I don't have a code for you this week, but stay tuned. Uh, they did give us some more Masterwork chests to, to give away, so we're going to try to do that over the next couple weeks. Uh, but when you use their service, when you tweet at them, when you let them know that you're doing it because of us, uh, that stuff is very helpful, especially around this time of the year whenever we are talking about next year. That's kind of how these things get signed uh, on an annual basis. And so we'd love to have them continue on as a partner because they've just been so amazing. And a lot of you have shown your support uh, to us and you've mentioned to Grubhub how much you've appreciated them. And I think that's great. I know you all know already about the Grubhub guarantee where your food is on time at the best price or, your, uh, or they will make it right. Uh, so thank you so much to Grubhub for sponsoring the show. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to sign up if you haven't used them yet. Uh, I know a lot of you use some of these competing services. Just give them a try. Give them a try. And uh, if you do through that link, it's actually very helpful for us. So thank you so much, Grubhub, for 
sponsoring the show. All right. Let's do another call. Mark is already off. Uh, what, what else do we got? What else do we got? Uh, we've got two more callers. It's going to be a bit of a shorter episode. We're, well, shorter with long topics, I guess. Um, it's time. It's it's time, D-L-N-A-U-Z, lol. You have trolled my chat for so long, and uh, that was the final straw. I'm so sorry. We'll we'll see you in the next life. Okay. Trevor Monreal, thank you for the 21 months. Papu Machina, thank you for the prime. Benjamin Mori Wakes, Pro Star Cheeto, uh, one step closer. Crayon, the Slather Post for two years. Danny Grimm gifted out six subs. Wow, thank you. Badger Yar, Photo LOL, and it's Volks. And it looks like Mark is here with Mike Spam. Mike Spam, where are you calling from? Uh, just outside of Seattle. Just outside of Seattle. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's cold here, which yes. is unfortunate. It's really cold in Salt Lake City. Uh, how cold is it there? Where there right now? Uh, most mornings when I get up and go to work, it's below freezing now. So yeah, no, right now it's 31 degrees here, and the highs have been like 37. I don't, I can't wait to get back to LA. Um, although I like Salt Lake. Anyway, what do you want to talk about on the show? Uh, you guys sort of brought it up earlier, but what I put in the topic chat was that. I don't have a lot of sympathy for players and teams who complain about being called lazy when players and teams spend most of the year not part of the discussion, and then they come around and say, hey guys, why are you calling us lazy at the end of the year? So when you say not part of the discussion, can you elaborate? Yeah. I, again, you guys sort of brought this up, but we spend most of the year talking about how is NA going to do at Worlds? How is NA going to do at Worlds? We get to Worlds, we don't perform, and then we have the annual NA, like, why did we lose fest? And then that all happens, and then after that we have players come out and say, hey guys, stop calling us lazy, here's all the reasons why it didn't work out for us. Which annoys me, because we spend the entire year with all these issues, Right, that these players know about and don't get leaked to the public, or don't get reported out in the public, or don't get mentioned by players. And then at the end of the year, we hear, well, actually, there were all these systemic issues that held us back. And so, if you knew about this, your expectations for us probably wouldn't be that high in the first place, right? That's what Vulcan's follow up tweet was. It's here's all these systemic issues that made it so our practice could not be at the same level of other regions. There's all these systemic issues. And it's not like these systemic issues all of a sudden were just figured out by players, right? Like, we found out about the issues with LCS scrims through Mr. Peter Dunn here in a podcast interview he did, right? Like, or maybe it was a Reddit comment. I don't remember. But either way, like, the... North America has terrible scrim culture, and here's the facts, comes out at the end of the year, right? Fans are completely in the dark, and then we find out at the end all these systemic issues. Why are we not hearing about this sooner, right? And I realize I'm ranting and rambling, and I apologize for that, but it's hard for me to then have sympathy for when players come out, and friends of players come out and say they're not having their side told when... They've had all this time to get their site out there, and it's now that we failed, do they feel the need to come out and defend themselves? Peter Dunn, Twitch chat said you have something you want to get off yeah, your chest. Yeah, I mean, so. basically, I completely agree with this take. Um, I mean, like, if you don't say your side of the narrative, how do you expect people to, to properly understand you? Uh, and I think people don't say it because they're worried about backlash. Like, frankly, I mean... It's really obvious which team I'm talking about when I say that certain teams in the middle of, in you know, at the top of LCS don't give a shit because they've actually come out and said that they don't give a shit in the regular season. But, you know, I'm... Okay, don't burn too many bridges. Um, but the, like, it's, it's, <laughs> it's super obvious which team I'm talking about. Um, but, but like, the... What I would say to this is if you don't say your side, it, it won't be said. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why... You know, things like Hotline League are, are, are really good avenues so that people can see in, inside, like, the thinking of teams, right? Like, a perfect example of this is Jizuke. Jizuke got shit on for, like, the first year and a half um, of his time in North America, and nobody, like, defended him or told his side of the story or anything 
Right? So of course he just keeps getting shit on. He gets keep keeps getting shit on because people don't see what he's doing. Like he doesn't make an effort to, to go and show, you know, the, the little bits of specifics. And, you know, this happens time and time again. Like you just sit there and you just take it and you're just quiet. And okay, yeah, I agree. I agree that it, it should be the responsibility of people to come and say this. Now who should say it? Should it be the players? Should it be the coaches? Should it be the orgs? That's an interesting question to have. I don't have the answer to this. And I'll be frank, like, being somebody who's willing to come out and say this means that you get a ton of backlash, like a ton of very unpleasant backlash. Um, so I, I don't I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but like people should be more brave to come and do it. Just accept that there's going to be backlash. I don't know who. That, I don't even uh, think there has to be backlash. Imagine know, if in order, four in months ago, ago there will be. There will be. <laughs> well, but imagine if four months ago, three months ago. Someone goes to Travis, right? Travis gets this scoop from an anonymous source that's, here's how much time players actually put in. Here's the truth. And yes, you know what? Travis is going to get backlash for defending players, but players aren't getting backlash for defending players. And I do think how the community at large reacts to what players say versus what quote-unquote sources say are meaningfully different. Um... I mean, I think the it, it's a very rose-tinted opinion that people won't get backlash for some of this stuff, whether internally or from fans, um, as well as, like, a lot of these topics have been talked about before quite a bit, um, and I don't blame newer fans for not knowing them because there's a churn rate, and for people like Travis and I who don't want to hit on these topics again for like the eighth time in our career in the middle of a split when there's other storylines to talk about. So there's, there's some reasons that it doesn't come up earlier. I think as well as the fact that um, there is this feeling that people will say, shut up, put up or shut up kind of thing, which I see all the time when people talk about some stuff um, heading into MSI or, or whatever it is in spring or in summer um, you kind of get this like perform at worlds or we don't care attitude from fans sometimes, which I think to Peter's point is egged on by sometimes players saying that themselves that they don't care about LCS. Like winning LCS is not always built up to be the accomplishment that it should be to make it feel like for, for players and fans, like, Hey, we did it. Awesome. Um, so like, I, I think there's a lot of things playing into it, but I, I, I ultimately agree with the sentiment that there should be more discussion and things like I put my video out about how I don't like NA scrims system i think it's really dumb i put that video out after we were eliminated from worlds maybe i should have put it out earlier in the I, i've had this problem jat and i have been talking about this on and off for like three months at this point basically in, in summer like maybe i should have made the video I, mean, I don't know if i have the power to actually enact any change but like maybe maybe i could have argued and made teams feel bad for doing one scrim block of five games i think it's dumb i think we copied g2 for no reason should i could have said that earlier um you know, like, I don't know. To be clear, I think the biggest offenders here are the teams. Like, if I had a player who was getting public hate for being quote-unquote lazy, as a team, I would feel very compelled to not necessarily address it head-on, but maybe put out content in the next week that shows much of a hard worker that player is. Why would you right? do that? Yeah. You're going to replace the player in uh, six months anyway. <laughs> You know what? You're right. My bad. Tra Travis is being facetious, but I agree with this point a lot, is that like there are indirect ways to combat this other than the confrontational ways that seems to boil over at the end of the year or like in these posts by Rigby and stuff. Um, not that Rigby or whoever is wrong to talk openly about it, but like um, you can show your team working hard. And I know there's the EG files, but those are like, I, I wish there was like some middle ground between full-on docu-series, which are, I think, a little too heavy and um, just, like, fun content that yeah. shows pro no players. No one goes out hard. and fights for the player. That's what I've been saying for a while, and I just think it's really oh disappointing. <laughs> Travis is stealing from Twitch chat audio listeners on the podcast afterwards. I mean, the joke is who said it in Twitch chat. Um, yeah, Peter. Peter okay. said it. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I agree with this stuff. I think, like... Teams just don't really have PR people, and they don't really have like I I think in the LCS you have a, a great deal of people who are marketing or content people, and they've just become sponsorship fulfillment people. Where it's not about how do I make content for the fans or how do I make 
content to help tell the story of these players. It's just, all right, we've sold this to X chair company uh, and we have to deliver 10 of these over the course of the split. So that's what we're making. Oh, they're not performing. Okay, well just uh, tell the sponsor that they're performing great or just spend and buy impressions. Blah. So I don't know. I, I very jaded tonight. I don't know why. I am I'm very positive about the LCS, but I think perhaps this for us, this the frustration around having to have this conversation is so annoying. Um thank you so much to Mike Spam for the call. Anything you want to shout out? The new TFT set, all right? It's set 4 again, all right? This is so hype. Like I'm so excited. I'm going to lose a 1000 hours into TFT again. My nice. life will be in shambles. I am beyond hype. They've hit it out of the park. Thumbs up. Thanks so much, uh, Mike Spam. I'll check out TFT because you've recommended it. I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Peace. Bye. Okay, we got one last caller to go. Thank you to, to Ellie Belly for the sub. Really appreciate it. I like the last TFT set. I'm sad it got flamed. Um, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, okay, okay. Peralt says it's, come to, it's boiled down to how can I make my metric. Yeah, I think some people... Yeah, you've got, you've got a lot of salespeople making the decisions around what the content is rather than the content people. That's a separate discussion. Washi is here. Washi, where are you calling from? Tampa, Florida. Tampa, Florida. What do you want to talk about on the show? Yeah, so um, I think uh, C9 dropping Jensen was a terrible idea. Um, I know C9 is known for getting new players to bring up, which I think they've done a great job at, and it's absolutely awesome. But I feel like the general consensus was that was that uh, bringing Jensen was a great move. He proved that in summer, and to some extent, Worlds, it, you know, previous history is, is better. But um, I just don't agree with the decision that, um, fr from both a performance and a branding angle, to, to get rid of him. Um, and on a broader scale, I feel like throwing veterans aside like this will have lasting effects since they won't potentially want to sign for new or different orgs, given this specific circumstance um, and his... Um, his performance are we are we sure that c9 dropped jensen uh, uh, uh i mean it's it's been reported that diplex diplex is yes probably but that doesn't necessarily mean dropped right like and that but by the way i'm not implying oh, that i have right, any separate information built? but his contract ended this year and so there's there's i've just noticed this is a trend among like the community to see a contract or to not not recognize uh, a contract end date means that like a departure could go both ways. They also picked up someone else though, uh, which is doesn't bode well for his circumstance. Well, I think Travis's point is that Jensen might have not wanted to resign. Maybe or they to him and they're like, mm, or Jensen could have been like, maybe I'm gonna check check out the 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 market and see what's out there. Or maybe C9 think... was like, we're only gonna pay you half of what you wanted before you were making before because the market dropped so like sign now or we're gonna go pick up somebody else and he's like oh i think i'm worth more and then he he doesn't sign like i just well, i think it is important to recognize that we don't know always how this i think goes down. we we don't know for sure but his deleted tweet um did not sound like a player who was excited to be in free agency again <laughs> Oof. You want me to talk about Jensen? Or do you want I, me to no, talk I'm, about I'm looking at the chat it? who said, because people are saying Jensen's contract was for 2024. Uh, I, okay, here, here's why I'm where I'm coming from. I need, what I will say is I need to go double check a couple other things before I continue on with the discussion about the 2024 stuff because it was, I had heard that he was able, like he had an out potentially at the end of this split maybe i misheard from people but that's where my confusion was coming from because i did not think that he i i think he had an uh, option to go out or something i don't know whatever anyway i don't know enough um to to talk definitively on this but regardless let's just say they dropped him fine fuck it fuck c9 they dropped him let's just go with that premise um sounds right yeah yeah sure um so you think this was a mistake caller and you think it's because of how good Jensen is? Uh, well that and, um, I mean, 
for sure. Uh, but I, I feel like it also diminishes, diminishes like veteran player and brand value. Um, he's always been held in very high regard, and yet he was expendable here. Um, it's like a I scratch my back, you scratch yours kind of thing. And he came in midway through the season. He, he got C9 to Worlds, and then he's dropped right afterwards. Um, and it feels extra bad because he used to be on that team for multiple years, you know? So it just feels like um, this sets like a standard of um, being expendable, um, even no matter performance, uh, veteranship, you know? Um, it, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. This, yeah. Peter Dunn, I've become... missed your tour because I've been uh, playing Magic and watching Brandon Sanderson talk. Uh, what, why is the whole chat going on about you and Jensen? Um, let's just say uh, Jensen. <laughs> let's just say that Jensen has uh, has never done me any wrong, uh, directly, personally, or 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 in any other in any other way, personally. Um, whilst I've been in North America, although there's definitely uh, definitely there are a lot of people. Uh, lots of Jensen fans who have definitely caused me a lot of pain in uh, various situations uh, that I don't really think is appropriate to talk about in this call. Um, but basically, uh, I think I got more death threats from Jensen fans than any other. Than oh. any other I mean, I mean, um, but Jensen, you know, I, Jensen didn't set his, you know, like crazy fans on me or anything, right? So. Um, so you know it's hard for me to be completely neutral in the Jensen situation. Um, I think that it's worth saying. Um, whew, I think it's very harsh on Jensen um, for what happened over the course of the year. Um, it's very telling though that even in times where Jensen was brought in, you know the response from several of his teammates was very lukewarm from people that weren't. Um, that weren't blabber, right? It's very telling that, you know, Fudge, I remember, gave an interview, one other person gave an interview where, where they were like, oh, we didn't, I didn't really think that much of Jensen, but blabber convinced me, and, you know, things like this. I can't remember who it was. Was it Fudge or was it Sven? Um, but I remember Fudge there was said something team. about that. Um, yeah. uh, I don't think Sven said anything. I don't remember. Oh, maybe, I can't remember, but Fudge definitely said said that. Fudge said that? Okay, I, I, I couldn't remember, so I, just, so I don't want to tar Sven with that, but, you know, it's very telling that, you know, he had a lot of work to do to convince his teammates that he was worth it right from the start of the split. You know, when you join a team, that's not the first thing you want to hear from your teammates in a in a public interview about you joining the team, right? Uh, if you are considered like a, a a very important key part of the team. Um, what would I say about him otherwise? I mean, I think he did his job. I think he he was. He was he, he he helped C9 get the title, right? C9 haven't won well, okay, they won with perks, but you know, they looked a bit rough in spring and you know, he he helped them get the title. I, I think maybe rather than it being a case of Jensen not being good enough, maybe it's a case that they just think Diplex and MNS are better, right? And what I would say about MNS is he has he has like almost caps level of hands, but um has been kicked off multiple teams in his career. So maybe Cloud9 have found the way uh, that they can get the best out of him. But that guy is crazy, crazy good. And, uh, you know, I'm excited for him to be in NA because he will help JoJo get better um, by playing against him in Champions Q if he doesn't get banned from Champions Q. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's... I mean, he's public, like, everyone knows it, right? Like, he's, he's basically yeah. the most popular person in existence. Um uh, okay, that's too far, but you know he's he's be he's been kicked off two teams, right? Uh, um, uh, like the on Diplex, Diplex was um, some. I've been helping a European team out in this off season, and Diplex was definitely one of the the, the top European mid laners that that was was around. Um, I think that he was very very hyped at the age of seventeen. If you'd asked me who was going to be better in twenty twenty two, him or VTO, I would have said him. Um, but I think that for whatever reason, he Vitality haven't been able to get the best out of him. So maybe Cloud9 see something there. But this guy was hyped, not quite to Caps level, but was hyped to like Humanoid Nemesis levels when he was coming up. Um, but his career is kind of stalled. So maybe they, maybe rather than it being Jensen wasn't good enough, uh, it's it's a case of they think these two guys could be incredibly good. 
Um, and, you know, I think it's a bit it's a bit harsh on Jensen, considering what he, he gave to the Org, but, um, I mean, that's how it is. I mean, I, I don't really have anything anything more productive to say than that but it's not it doesn't necessarily have to be a case they think he was bad but maybe they just think these guys are better the story of north america that guy's not bad but this other person that fans don't know about is even better this guy from somewhere that's not america let me tell you about him or or canada it's a north america region mark what the hell is a Canada? Uh, again, it's we're not making we're not trying to sound xenophobic. It's more just I don't know. I got I got to do the video about the import that the what the act of importing is just so that I can link people to Travis, it. Travis, people think that we're being like, here's your problem. When, whenever you do one of those videos, they're very dry. They're very serious. They have high presentation value with like numbers and graphs and stuff. You just need to make a just go buy a boomerang and get in front of a green screen and do your Twitter boomerang thing, the image, but make a fucking TikTok troll ass video about boomeranging players in and out of the LCS and make it a one minute troll video and people will realize how many people are boomeranging around. Do I get a boomerang, Travis? Weren't you? You were here uh, for two years. Yeah, you were here for two years. Oh, so that's okay. So, 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 where's the boundary? Is it eighteen months? Is it like twelve months? Is it? I mean, honestly, yeah, these days, if we could get twelve contract, months, it's pretty good. They usually show up in November. Present here. They usually show up. They show up in February because they missed the first several weeks of lock-in because they're getting their visa, and then they leave in August after they, you know, don't or September after they don't qualify for Worlds. Uh, uh, it's it's if, if it's if you've been put on Exodus here and you're just waiting to leave again. Yeah, it's a it's an or eight month retiring. vacation. That's the thing yeah. is it's not about immigration; it's about tourism. That's why I'm not I'm not anti-immigrant. I'm anti. We're not anti-immigrant. We're anti-tourist. Yes, exactly. LCS tourism, honestly, <laughs> needs to end. The LCS tourism thing that is a pretty good joke. <laughs> hashtag That's, hashtag stop LCS tourism. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Summit, Summit had to cut his tour short. Okay. Uh, He's coming back? Yeah, well. I mean, j just one final thing on the scene, I think. Like, I'm very excited to see how Diplex will do in a different environment from Vitality. Right? Like, for me personally, that's super, super exciting. And Eminez, I'm really excited to see um, uh, how, how, how things work themselves out with Eminez, um, which should be entertaining no matter what, uh, whether the issues are resolved or not. So, I mean, for me, those two signings are pretty high, right? Like, I, I don't have the emotional attachment to Jensen that maybe many of your viewers do. So, so for me, I, I saw that move, and I, I, I admit my first thought was, holy shit, they signed Diplex. This, is, this sounds really exciting. Um, but, you know, having heard what this caller has to say and having heard what you've had to say, Travis, I do concede the... Uh, it does seem a little bit uh, slightly, maybe a little bit ungrateful, um, but, but sure. I, I'm I'd just, just excited... To interview Diplex for the next eight months. Um, all right. Thank you. Wait. Well, actually, Mark, you didn't. You didn't sit. Did you have an, an opinion or take, or do you think we just covered it? No. I mean, Caller kind of said it when he talked about C9. Usually finds people like Niski wasn't the sexiest pickup. I mean, he bounced around a little bit from initially the Envy, the back over, then back to a C9 and stuff. Uh, I, I generally trust their ability to find good players, but I also sympathize with uh, losing what should feel like a franchise player after a relatively successful stint, you know? Yeah. And he was good at Worlds, too. You know? It wasn't like Jensen went out there and laid an egg. He was far from the biggest problem on that team. Anyway, Twitch chat, having a good time. All right, thank you so much, Caller, for the call. Anything you want to shout out before we say goodbye? Uh, yeah, uh, you guys, uh, you guys are awesome and have fostered a wonderful community. So I love being in Twitch chat and hanging out with you guys in Discord. I uh, want to shout out my Clash team, Mike, Simon, Geraldine, and Nate. Crit mode is the greatest, and I love you all. And good night. Good night. See ya. See you, dude. Thank you. All right, that is the show. See ya. No, uh, <laughs> Peter, what do you want to? Just one more final thing, Peter. That's that's been your motto tonight. So what what what's the final thing you got for us? No, just to say thank you for having me on the show. I I think this may be the last time where uh, I'll have productive things to say about NA for a time. So it's been fun. I think we've been on. I've been you've invited me on the show maybe six or seven times over the past two years. Just to say it's been fun. 
Yeah. Continue it, and you know, I'll be looking forward to watching your content from across the pond. You know? I just want to say, I'm I pre- I have... the world cup thing was hilarious. I just say, like the 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 Palafox thing and the uh, the how much did you pay for your ticket thing. Oh yes, the, thank you. Amazing. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Did you see the the ticket video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm glad Peter had fond memories of the content in NA at least. Yes, you know? exactly. Well, uh, again, content. There's only one type of content these days, and it's. Not team content. Okay. Uh, but no, Peter, thank you. Uh, we know that you have many regions to choose from when you plan your next vacation. And we just want to say that if you would like to plan another trip to our wonderful region and enjoy our great food and our competitive pay and you know our good yeah. weather, we'd love to have you back. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, blame game this week, probably coming out tomorrow afternoon. Um, just talking about the drama, you know, other than that, not much, uh, kind of hibernating. Yeah. What did I watch recently? I've been watching survivor. We didn't talk about this. I've been watching survivor, uh, watch black Adam watched, uh, I don't know. I haven't paid attention. Some earlier today, man. I don't know. Earlier today, I messaged Mark and I said, "Hey, we should talk about that Needham interview on the show tonight." And he said, "Yeah." Oh yeah. Well, why don't you find me the topic that brought it up in in pleb topics? You know. Okay. Well, then I blame you, the caller, uh, or the callers for, or attempted callers Travis, for not. How many times do we have to? Well, this is the exact same thing that happened last weekend. If you have a topic you want to talk about, you have to prime it to to, to get a caller. Like, I thought I, really I did at the about... start. I said we're giving tips on things. If I said we have fifty minute, we have a whole fifty minute interview. I'm sure there's something people want to talk about. Clearly, they didn't. Clearly, no, because you didn't tell them. Literally, you, you like this is the trick. You say what you want to talk about. Someone will make it the topic, and then they they know that they're going to get picked. That's why they that's why they copy. But if you just say, "Oh, I'd love to talk about the John Needham interview," that wasn't specific enough. Then they don't know what to say. But if you're like, "I'd love to talk about John Needham's response to uh, Reddit sentiment that there's too many imports," boom, topic in there. I grab that. We're good to go. The fans are too lazy. All right, <laughs> that's why this show is failing. It's because the fans are too lazy all right anyway uh thanks to everybody that came up and said hi to me in salt lake city either at mtg summit or at dragon steel it's been really cool I had a great conversation with several people actually one thing that was really fun was i got to nor- normally like at worlds i'm like working and so people come up and say hi and i can only talk to them for like 30 seconds or less but at MTG Summit, I was literally like playing magic games with people that would come up and say hi. We played Commander a couple times with people that were just like, I'd be walking to go play a Commander game and we just pull somebody that said hi to me or whatever. I'd be like, let's go. So that's been really fun. Um, but yeah, thank you, everybody. Uh, Dinner with well, the next episode is with Steve, and that is coming out either tomorrow, Wednesday, or Thursday. Um, I also have a video which if I was home I would be showing right now which is the next uh, surprise test it features many people like the return of Poe Belter and Cyan the mega IQs but also people like Porter Robinson and Dom Monahan and Billy Boyd they are so fucking funny we were like crying laughing while we were recording with them Uh, so stay tuned for that Uh, and yeah that's the show thanks uh, Peter Dunn for your time Thank you, Mark Zimmerman. See y'all later.